Terry Garr. November 18, 1989, 4.13 a.m. at my home in L.A., my phone rings. And this woman's voice says, is this Terry Garr? And I go, yes, I think so. She says, well, I just want you to know that I've been sleeping with your boyfriend since August and uh, that I just caught him in bed with another girl this morning at 6 or something like that, or what, what I, the, earlier, like 3 in the morning, and I threw all of his potted plants in the pool, and um, I got your number from his phone book. And I'm like, who is this? What? <laughs> Hello? And um, so I, I listened to this, and I said, well, that's, that's very interesting. Yes, my name is Donna, and um, I was going around with this guy for quite a long time, and he always told me, I knew that he knew you, and he said that you were business partners with him. I was business partners with him, okay. So I went, all right, that's interesting. And um, he would drive me around in your car. I had a Mercedes at the time, and he, he told me that it was his car. But um, this girl, who was this aspiring actress, w took the uh, initiative to look in the glove compartment and see that it was registered to me. So it was my car that he was driving her around, telling her that it was his car. All right, so big deal. And I, I was, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the information. And I hung up the phone. And I thought a lot about it. What should I do? Should I just sit here? I mean, I was to totally blindsided. I'm completely naive about this. But I was starting to hyperventilate. So that was around 4 in the morning. So around by 7 in the morning, I thought, you know, he has left a few things at my house. This was a guy I was having a relationship with. We were actually trying to have a baby together. And we were trying to, I mean, uh, I was going to take those fertility drugs. So I was a little bit um, crazy from extra hormones. Anyway. <laughs> So he had a few things that he left at my house in drawers. He was practically living with me. So I thought, I'll just put all these things in a box and I'll take them back to them now because obviously he doesn't need them anymore. So I put in the socks and the underwear and uh, there's a few baby pictures and all that, whatever crap of his was left at my house. I put it all in a box and I was just throwing all the stuff in a box. I happened to see a hammer sitting there. I thought, well, I'll throw that in the box too. I really had no premeditation about this. I just threw it in there. And I decided that I should take these things back to him. So I got in my car. I put the box in the car. And I start driving up there to Bel Air, and, and it's like 7.30 in the morning. And I now realize how murder can happen because, you know, I was just so, nothing was going to stop me at all. I mean, if someone came up to me and said, here's a $1 million cash in $10 bills if you stop this car, I go, you'll have to keep your fucking money because I'm going. I'm up there and I'm not stopping. So I pull up to his house, his little faux, you know, whatever, ranch house. They make a lot of these in, in L.A., and um, I look at it, and I go, I, I pull out this box of stuff, and I walk up to the front door, and I ring the doorbell, nothing, doorbell, 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 doorbell nothing, nothing. So I go, well, what the hell? So I pull out, here's your underpants, and here's your socks, and here's your stuff, and here's your pictures, and it's me, and um, oh, well, there's a hammer in there. What are you going to So I pick up the hammer, and I start breaking the windows. Break, break, crash, 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 crash. He lived in one of those houses that had, um, like, um, I don't know what you call it, like Tudor, you know, like a lot of little glass. Uh, break, break, crash, 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 crash. Okay, here's the... And uh, the front door, crash, 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 crash. Uh, so I walk, walk around and I hear nothing stirring in the house. I'm amazed. But anyway, I go to the garage. They have little windows up there. Crash, 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 crash. On the side of the house, there's some windows on the side. Crash, crash, crash. I get back to the kitchen and I'm crash, crash, crash. And I see him in there like this, like staggering on the, with a, in a robe on the phone. So I think, well, uh, who's he calling? The police? My God. And when I see him, I come out with some of my best um, valley girl talk, which was like motherfucker, cocksucker, uh, bastard, son of a bitch. I mean, he was just looking at me. I really wonder sometimes what he was thinking at that moment. I know what I was thinking. And um, it was one of those moments that just ch ch changed my life. You know, I just thought, I'll never be the same after this. I was really, it was a big wake-up call, okay? So I started walking around the back. I figure it's time to wrap this up. He's on the phone to the police or something, so I guess it's got to be sort of, maybe I better haul ass out of there. So I walk around the side of the house, and I, as I come around the front of the house, around the side of the garage, there's this cop. It was a fake cop, Bel Air Patrol. I don't know what they are. And he's got a gun pointed at me. And for the first time in my life, I was very happy about this, he recognized me. And he said, oh, Miss Gar, um, are you all right? See, I think he thought I was the victim, which, of course, I was. 
but in a different kind of way. I mean, you know, he, he thought I was in there being, you know, molested or whatever. So he's, I said, well, I am now. <laughs> and, um, and I went back and got in my car and drove away. <laughs> and that was sort of the end. And I, I went home and I, I sat around for a while. I was like puffing and puffing, walking around my house and well, I did that, and now, you know, by this time it's like 9 a.m. or something, and, I, and I've done a lot of work from since 4 in the morning. So I start calling people up to tell them about this, and, you know, some of my friends said, oh, I, I told you so, I tried to tell you. And I said, I don't remember anyone trying to tell me about this guy, but anyway. Um, and some people just, you know, they tried to help me, calm me down, and I wasn't having any of that. Some people just said, you know, I, I'm weeding the lawn, will you call me later? I mean, <laughs> they weren't really interested in it. So, um... I, I, later that day, um, I, I decided not to let this stop me from my life and I'm going on with my life, even though this horrible thing has happened and I have all these raging hormones. And so I went to this, um, I had been to the, invited to this art exhibit, art opening at a gallery, because you know, I wasn't gonna let this incident um, interfere with my sense of art and <laughs> my, uh, my whole aesthetic <laughs> feeling. So I, I walked into this, um, this is a really L.A. Hollywood story, and I walked into this um, art gallery, and there was people there like Angelica Houston, and I think, um, oh, I can't, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. The woman, the, that wonderful um, model with the gap tooth, uh, Lauren well, exactly, Lauren Hutton. Oh, they're all being different. It was the big A crowd at this place. So I walk in, and you know, I'm just walking around looking at the art, not really seeing anything too much, but there. And someone uh, came up to me and said, so how are you? I said, how am I? I'll tell you how I am. So um, I told everybody the story. You know, I just I just broke all the windows in this guy's house because. Blah, blah, blah. So then, interestingly enough, all these other women came up to me and started telling me their story. Oh, you want to hear what I did once? And I'm not going to say if it was Lauren or if it was you know Angelica or anybody. But there's a lot of good stories. Cause this apparently has happened to a lot of women, and uh, my guess is not just in L.A. But since it's an L.A. story. So uh, one girl said, you know, I went with this guy. It's always guys like this. Uh, he was very vain, and he had all these Gucci or Armani suits in his closet, you know, like a dozen of them. And I snuck in the house one night, and I just cut off the left leg of every suit. <laughs> they were, I said, very creative, very nice, very subtle, very nice. So uh, the next uh, girl said, you know, I just did something. I just put a little hose. I didn't know he was going away for the weekend. I put a hose in the bathroom window and turned it on and left. And so that was, I think, nice and simple. Very nice. You did that. But um, there was a lot of these stories. One, one girl came up to me. This is one of my favorites. And she said, you know, I got so pissed off. And he started going with this other woman. And we were having, you know, everyone's got the story about it. It was the perfect relationship. Of course, it wasn't. I'm sure, you know, Lacey Peterson thought that hers was good, too. Oh, never. I don't want to bring that up but it was in California. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, she said I went to the house uh, I, and I went and I shaved my name in the dog's back. <laughs> so that, you know, for the next six months, this woman who's there, I was like, who's Judy? Oh, ne <laughs> never mind, never mind. Uh, uh, and I thought that was very good. So um, this apparently happens to a lot of, uh, of women because of the way men are. No, but I've decided now, because of um, I, being in L.A. and being in Hollywood and, you know, hearing all these stories about how the actors and actresses of Hollywood, me being one of them, are sort of naive and narcissistic and self-centered. We don't see the truth until, of course, it's right sitting on our heads and going, oh, my God, he's fooling around on me. Because, you know, I, um, it might have something to do with my relationship with my father who was, you know, my parents came from here in New York. Um, they worked on Broadway plays and stage and musicals and stuff. And they went to Hollywood to become famous. Like, it's such a big mistake. Um, not really a big mistake, but um, it doesn't happen that often. And um, my father was a, um, I have six words. Well, he was a very funny, um, semi-famous, Irish Catholic alcoholic comedian. <laughs> that might explain a lot of my choice in men. But... Um, <laughs> He, he had a struggle out there, and, then, and my mom did too. And so I always end up picking up these, these kind of guys. And um, I figure this happens a lot in Hollywood because there's a lot of sordid, weird people out there seeking fame and fortune for nothing. I mean, now my parents did have nothing. They all had talent and stuff. But even if you have talent in L.A., you don't get chances. I mean, look at Andy and look at Sue. I mean, people, you know, you don't get the chances all the time. So um, I figure that also, I mean, it... it there's these weird relationships. I mean, look at Robert Blake and his wife. Uh, I mean, he killed her, I think. We'll see what happens at the trial. Or, and then there's the OJ thing. I mean, you know, and I live in Brentwood now, too. 
And um, when I got divorced, I thought, well, you know, I guess a semi-famous celebrity is allowed to kill their spouse in Brentwood if you live there. I mean, it's, it's okay, you can do it. I thought about it too. But here's the trick. Um, I think in every relationship, after a year or so, it, uh, everyone gets to the point where they want to kill the other person. I mean, it just happens. And the trick is, you know, to, you, have to, uh, you have to kind of avoid that and somehow. And um, you, have to, you have to get just up to the part where you're going to kill, and then you have to not do it. Well, I think <laughs> I, um, I, re I recommend the, bi the windows. Uh, that worked for me very well. And um, all right, that's, that's the end of my story. <laughs> Terry Gar.